This is chapter 16, the respiratory emergencies chapter. First thing I wanted to talk about is how we would differentiate between respiratory distress and respiratory failure. Let's say you arrive on scene to the patient on the left, the female. She has a history of emphysema. She's having some kind of uh, respiratory infection going on. She presents initially with a breathing rate of 40 times a minute. It's labored. Her oxygen saturations initially on room air were about 88%. Her pulse is 110. You apply high flow oxygen to her at 15 liters per minute via the non the mask, and her saturations rise to 95% on the oxygen. So what's that telling you? It's telling you that the mechanism that allows her body to absorb oxygen and exchange gases at the alveolar level is still functioning. She's still able to get the oxygen into her bloodstream. So she's still able to compensate for her respiratory difficulties. The gentleman on the other side here on the right, he presents, you arrive on scene, he presents initially pretty much the same way. His saturations are 88%. He's still breathing 40 times a minute. It's labored, his pulse is 110. You put him on high flow to O2 and his oxygen saturation stays at 88%. So now that should be telling you that this guy is in failure because his body is failing to compensate for his difficulty. The mechanism that allows gases to exchange is failing. And now more than likely this guy in the next few minutes, you're gonna wind up having to do bag valve mass ventilation on this guy. He's becoming a candidate for positive pressure ventilation. If we don't intercede, on this gentleman quickly enough, or we don't do it effectively enough, or we don't get there in time, they can develop into respiratory arrest. Uh, I'm sure some of you out there have uh, been an athlete. You ran track, football, basketball, uh, field hockey, soccer, whatever it might be, and uh, more than likely you've experienced uh, muscle failure. Basically, you get so tired you can't continue. You, you wear yourself out from exercising. Imagine yourself having difficulty breathing to the point where you have to use all those accessory muscles to, to breathe, to try to stay alive. Remember, remember, the muscles that we breathe with, the skeletal muscles, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, they're the exact same muscles that are in your arms and in your legs. They, they function the same way. They can fail if you use them too hard or too much. So this person's been breathing really hard, uh, trying to get air in, and they've been working really hard to breathe, and now they're so fatigued, their muscles can no longer contract. And if the muscles can't contract, the intercostal muscles can't contract, then their chest can't rise and fall. So now their breathing has ceased, they're in arrest. And then within about three to five minutes after their last breath, their heart stops, they go into cardiac arrest. So we want to get there hopefully before this happens, and when we get there before it happens, by doing bag valve mass ventilations, we could prevent this from happening. If you arrive on scene and there's this person presenting this way, they still have a pulse, but they're not breathing effectively, you know what to do. You take out your bag valve mask and you give them positive pressure ventilation. Now there's a number of conditions uh, this chapter covers, uh, respiratory distress conditions essentially. Talk about these somewhat briefly, hopefully. Emphysema is a, a category of, uh, of disease processes. It's called uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Uh, this is caused usually by smoking cigarettes. It takes years and years to occur. And the lungs themselves, including the alveoli, like you see here in this picture, the alveoli becomes stiff and distended, and it can't really uh, hold the same amount of air that it did before, and it, can't, it cannot exchange gases, both carbon dioxide and oxygen, as well as it did before the disease set in. So this person always has problems breathing. They work really hard to breathe because they have... They have uh, this stiffness of their lungs, essentially. And because of this, carbon dioxide does not get exhaled. So they wind up retaining carbon dioxide in their body, and their carbon dioxide levels rise. 
and because they can't get good air into the base of their lungs and the, alve and the alveoli don't exchange gases very well, they don't have a very high level of oxygen in their bloodstream. Um, typically, an emphysemic, they normally have a room air saturation of about 90% or so. That's pretty average. And that's their normal daily saturation level. And that's why a lot of these people are on, are on home oxygen. They have a nasal cannula, two liters, four liters at home to, to, uh, to supplement what they're missing, essentially. These people present as usually older people. They're thin. Um, they call them, they call them uh, pink puffers uh, because they have a tendency to have a pink tinge to their skin, kind of an abnormally bright pink tinge. And what that is is, is it's the carbon dioxide they're retaining. They, uh, they can't get rid of it, so it turns their skin kind of an, art an artificial pink color. And because of this, because their skin is so bright pink, it hides the cyanosis. So you can't see uh, the cyanosis on these patients because of the really high concentrations of, of carbon dioxide. They'll, they have cough sometimes, it's usually non-productive. You, you listen to their lungs, they have wheezes, maybe some gurgling bronchi sounds. Um, the reason why they usually call you is because they have some kind of lung infection. Um, the patients who have chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease are very prone to uh, things like pneumonia or uh, bronchial infections, uh, like a viral or, um, or bacterial bronchial infection because of their disease process. Now, another disease process that's in the same category it's also a COPD disease, is chronic bronchitis. And what happens with chronic bronchitis is the alveoli don't get damaged, but the bronchial tubes do. And the bronchial tubes become swollen, distended, and they start secreting extra mucus. So it kind of blocks and clots up their bronchial tubes. It makes it very difficult for them to get air in and out. But the alveoli are still functioning, so they're still able to exchange gas. So chronic bronchitis patients do not trap the carbon dioxide that the emphysemics do. So these people are called blue bloaters. And traditionally, usually they're overweight, and you'll see the cyanosis. You'll see the, the blue lips and the blue nail beds and the blue uh, eyelids and things like that on them because they don't have that carbon dioxide to mask the cyanosis. And they're chronically cyanotic, and they're chronically low on oxygen as well. Probably, again, in the 80s or 90s is normal for them. And they're probably on all kinds of medications for this, including oxygen, essentially. And they will also call you because they're short of breath. And you'll say to yourself, well, wait a minute. You have chronic bronchitis. You're always short of breath. Well, yes, but now because of some type of bronchial infection, or pneumonia, they're more short of breath than normal, and they probably have a fever going on, and that's why they call. Asthma attacks. So basically an asthma attack is something gets into the respiratory tract and it irritates the bronchial tubes and it causes them to, to contract and constrict and start to secrete uh, mucus. Uh, people have asthma attacks, they're born with this condition. Some develop them later in life. Some asthma attacks can be caused by exercise and, and, and other, other mechanisms. But ultimately, ultimately this is what happens. Uh, people who have asthma usually have inhalers like albuterol, which is a beta-2 specific inhaler, atrovent, uh, combivent, some of, the, some of the, the rescue inhalers out there that you might encounter. Um, they're going to call 911 usually because their inhalers don't work. These people have, you know, have had asthma attacks before. They usually can break the attack using their inhalers. It doesn't work. So that's when they call you. Now, they're going to be dyspneic, which basically means they're going to feel short of breath. Uh, they'll have a dry cough. This is seen primarily, though, in young kids, like under the age of like 12 or so. 
Uh, they'll have wheezing because of the bronchoconstriction. Uh, they'll, they'll be tachypnic. They'll be breathing ra more rapidly than normal. They'll be tachycardic, over 100 beats per minute. Uh, they'll be anxious, a little apprehensive. And you can only imagine why is a couple of reasons. One, because of the hypoxia and because the brain is sensitive to hypoxia, it makes them feel anxious. And of course, if you were having problems breathing, you'd probably feel anxious anyway. And this is why we, when we get there, we really want to, to try to help them with their inhalers because even though they may have tried to do it themselves prior to arrival, because of the anxiety, because of the fear of what's going on, they might have done it incorrectly. So if we coach them through it and get them to do it correctly, maybe it will break their attack possibly. Now, like with other types of respiratory difficulties, asthmatics use accessory muscles to breathe, those same skeletal muscles, and they too can fatigue. Uh, and we get there and they're lying on the floor, they're lying in bed or on the sofa, and they're, they can't speak, their eyes are open, they're still alive, but their chest is barely rising and falling. The problem with this situation, as with other situations, is they have increased resistance inside their bronchial tree. So in, in, in their lungs, their lungs are so tight, they can't move air very effectively. So your first move here is, of course, to do bag valve mass ventilations. The problem with this is, is if you, if you apply a BVM to their, to their nose and mouth and you, you proceed to ventilate them, their lungs are so tight, very little or even none of that air is going to make it all the way down to the alveoli because of that increased resistance. A lot of it's going to escape out and around the mask. It's going to get just wasted and goes into their stomach and all kinds of horrible other things. So they need bag valve mass ventilations, but we have to do it a little differently. So this isn't written down anywhere. I've, I've done it a few times in the field over the last like, 25 years or so. What you do is you get your bag valve mask, and of course you'll put a nasal pharyngeal airway in or something like that, uh, and you have your partner, because you're always gonna have a partner with you, or worst case scenario, a security guard, or whoever might be there to help you, you have them take their hands, you have them straddle the patient, facing the patient, yeah, and you have them take their hands and s spread out their fingers and thumbs and lay their hands under their breasts of the, the where, like, kind of where the breastbone is essentially. And you, you ventilate the patient, you squeeze as best you can, get the air in as, as best you can, and as you let go of the bag, your partner's going to push down, use his body weight or her body weight to push down and squeeze the patient's ribs in and upward. What you're doing, you're artificially exhaling this patient's air from their lungs. So you're, they're squeezing this air out of the patient's lungs artificially under a much greater, higher pressure than the patient can do themselves. And you're forcing all that air out of their lungs, which leaves a negative pressure inside their thorax. So on that very next breath that you deliver, when you squeeze that bag, what you're going to notice, it's going to go in a lot easier because it's now being sucked in by that negative pressure created by that, that, that chest compression, I guess, if you want to call it that. We're not doing CPR. This is, this is not the two-handed CPR like you learned, you know, uh, 30 to 2 and all that. This is, you, you place your hands, you, you spread your fingers out over their rib cage, uh, with your thumbs on their sternum and you're just going to squeeze in use the, your body weight to do so and then as you let up take the weight off the chest allow your partner to ventilate that patient it, it works um, don't worry about one every six seconds or one every five seconds just worry about getting in as many breaths safely as you can within the time period of a minute or so so if you can get five or six breaths in a minute doing this, that's totally bitching. Now pneumonia, pneumonia is, is highly contagious. So if you suspect someone who has pneumonia, whether it's bacterial or uh, viral, uh, put a mask on yourself and also on the patient as well. 
Uh, this is an airborne transmission. People, they, they cough, they breathe this stuff out, we breathe it in and we get sick. Um, signs and symptoms of pneumonia, uh, usually it's going to be a fever. They can have chest pain. Uh, they get very dehydrated. Uh, their urine can be very dark as well. They get very weak. They can't walk. They're unable to ambulate because they're so weak and so worn out from this. Um, you can listen to the lung sounds and what you might hear you might hear clear lung sounds everywhere except one area, and you'll hear crackles in that one little area of some point in their lungs. And that's the plume of bacteria that's developed in there, and that's causing that crackling effect, which is causing in you know, their problem, essentially. Put them on oxygen. It's, it's very appropriate. Uh, and again, uh, put a mask on yourself. Uh, pulmonary emboli. So... I'm sure you heard about the people who uh, fly in an airplane for 19 hours to Tokyo and they get off the plane and then they die. Or someone's been lying in bed for weeks and weeks and weeks due to some kind of previous surgery and they develop, what happens is they, they develop these blood clots and the blood clots flow, uh, float up to the lungs and they occlude an artery in the lungs and it shuts off the blood flow to that area of the lung. Um, if it's a small emboli, you can live uh, some treatment uh, and maybe some surgery. If it's a large, massive emboli, they die within minutes of the, uh, the onset. Usually how they present is they're totally fine, and then suddenly, a minute later, they have a sudden onset of sharp, pinpoint chest pain, Literally, they can point to exactly where it hurts because right under there where they're pointing is more than likely going to be the clot. Uh, they can't breathe. Their oxygen saturations are going to be low, like below 94% definitely, and sometimes even below 90%. And they're going to have a history of either recent surgery, uh, prolonged uh, sitting in a chair for hours and hours and hours, or being bedridden or something like that, uh, if you listen carefully to that. Treatment is rapid transport to the closest trauma center that can treat this. This is a, if it's serious, it's treated with surgical procedures and you have to have a surgeon available to do it. So a trauma center is a really good facility because trauma centers have surgeons available 24 hours a day. Now pulmonary edema, we've talked about congestive heart failure a few times already. So pulmonary edema, the number one cause of this is, is cardiogenic in nature. It's usually from a heart attack. I think the number one uh, cause of congestive heart failure is a myocardial infarction, as a matter of fact, a uh, heart attack, essentially. So this fluid collects. It, it backs up from the left side of the heart. It collects into the lungs, and unfortunately, it starts to flood around and in the alveoli, which blocks the, the gas exchange making the person feel short of breath, which they actually are. Also, this could be non-cardiac, which a drowning patient or someone who's aspirated fluids in their lungs uh, can have the same problem. Now, when it comes to signs and symptoms, uh, more than likely their, their number one chief complaint with this is going to be difficulty breathing. Uh, that increases if they lie flat. So more than likely, they've been sitting up, maybe, maybe even sleeping, sitting up, like straight up, upright, because they can't sleep laying back or laying down. Uh, they probably have a heart history. They probably have a cardiac history. They probably will have nitroglycerin, aspirin, uh, high blood pressure medications, things like that on their list. Now, the reason why I got the Bierstein there is because when you have this fluid in your lungs, this edema in your lungs, and you're breathing so rapidly to try to compensate. It agitates that plasma, that liquid in your lungs, and it turns it into frothy, foamy uh, substance, kind of like the, the head of a beer like you see on this picture right here. And as you, you can only guess is that if you have a, a quarter of a cup of liquid in, in a liquid state, and you agitate that into a foam, it, it changes in size exponentially. A quarter of a cup of, of water or a liquid, or in this case plasma, can be agitated into three or four or five cups of 
of foam. So what happens is, is as this frothy sap grows and grows and grows, it starts to fill the lungs up, even to the point where it gets so bad, they wind up spitting out this pink, froth, frothy kind of foam out of their mouth. They're spitting it up out of their lungs, essentially. When you listen to the lung sounds, you're going to hear crackles, or you're going to hear the rails, that fine, crackly sound that we associate with pulmonary edema due to, due to uh, cardiac issues. <clears throat> high, high flow oxygen, bag valve mass ventilations, all very appropriate depending on the severity. Now, spontaneous pneumo, uh, pneumothorax, if you break down the word pneumothorax, so pneumo uh, is uh, air, essentially, and thorax, is, of course, is the chest cavity. So what this says is that there's air in the chest cavity. It's not in the lungs, it's in the chest cavity. So what happens is, is this person, they, the pleura, the lining of their, their lungs, ruptures, and it causes the lung to collapse. And air, air floods into the chest cavity, causing the pneumothorax. This is a spontaneous uh, uh, condition because it does not require any trauma. Uh, this is usually a tall, young males, like basketball height, tall, young males, and what happens is, is as they're going through their growth spurts, as they're developing, you know, as a young child to a teenager to an adult, they go through their growth spurts and their lungs stretch and they get, they get certain areas of their lungs that are weak or have been weakened by this growth spurt. And this is where usually these spontaneous ruptures occur. Uh, and they can just be walking down the street, they could cough too forcibly, uh, they can jump off of a, of, a, of a chair onto the floor and hold their breath. These are all calls I've been on with patients with this, and they just suddenly, their lungs will start to collapse, essentially. Provide them high flow oxygen. If you're listening to their lung sounds, more than likely on the affected side, you'll hear little or no air movement, but on the unaffected side, you'll hear good, clear lung sounds. And their oxygen saturations will be low, probably below 94% for sure. And one of the other marked things I see is even when you apply oxygen, the saturations don't really go up very much. Another clue into all of this. But give them high flow too. Uh, listen to the lung sounds. And again, this is another good candidate for a trauma center, just in case they need surgical intervention. Um, normally, these things heal on their own. But if the, if the, ble if the bleb is, or the blebby is big enough, the hole is big enough, they have to go in and actually sew the thing up or remove that part of the lung. So you can see what I talked about earlier, they're breathing fast, they can be sweaty, uh, their complaint's going to be shortness of breath, uh, and again, this is going to happen very suddenly. Hyperventilation syndrome. So this was, uh, you call it a panic attack if you want, but this person for some, some uh, psychogenic reason, uh, this person's having some kind of meltdown and they start breathing really fast. They're physiologically healthy people. The difference is because they're so scared or upset, they breathe really, really fast and they blow off all of their carbon dioxide. Now the normal levels of carbon dioxide in a normal healthy person who's not hyperventilating is around between 35 and 45. That's kind of like the numbers, right? That's a range, basically. When these people are hyperventilating at you know, 24, 28, 30 breaths a minute, they're down into the teens. They're at 15 or 14 or something like that. And what that does is it affects the fluid that surrounds your, your brain. That we have the, uh, the uh, uh, the, the, the meningeal layers there and the uh, cerebral spinal fluid gets affected and it changes the pH levels of your C-spine fluid. And it affects the, I think it's the, the, the pyramidal areas of, uh, of your brain, which are actually control your muscles or some of your muscles anyway. And what happens is, is they start getting cramps to their fingers and toes, and it's called carpal pedal spasms. You walk in the door and this person has these cramped looking fingers that they can't straighten out and their toes are all twisted and up and looking like they're all you know, cramped and everything. And they get numbness to their face and they're very upset and they're breathing really fast. 
and this is all caused, these, these physiological effects of the numbness and the spasms is all caused by this change of their pH levels in their C-spine fluid. So obviously if you can get them to slow their breathing down to some closer to normal, um, this all just goes away essentially. Uh, find out what is causing the psychological issue going on today, the whatever's happening, whatever the, the mechanism that set this thing off. Separate the person from the cause. If, it, if they're having an argument, uh, if, this, if the person that caused this is still in the room, separate the people. Uh, that helps a lot. Talk to the person, uh, explain uh, why they're feeling the way they are, and explain that if they can slow down their breathing with your coaching, obviously, they'll feel better. They won't feel those cramping and numbness that they feel now. So when it comes to people hyperventilating, um, years ago what people would do is they would, they would give the patient a paper bag to breathe into. And the idea was is the person would breathe into a paper bag, they would retain their carbon dioxide, it would increase their carbon dioxide levels, um, and then they would feel better. Well, the problem is, is that there are other types of conditions that mimic hyper hyperventilation syndrome. So unless you're absolutely certain that this is hyperventilation syndrome, um, that would be a bad thing. Imagine if this person really had a serious respiratory problem, an actual physiological problem like asthma or, or something like that, and you give them a paper bag to breathe in. Um, you could literally kill them. So we never put a paper bag um, on this person's face and you know, give them to them. And if they want oxygen, you're welcome to give it to them. They don't really need it. Their oxygen saturations will be 100% because they're breathing so deeply and so quickly. But if they demand it, it's not going to hurt them. It's not really going to make them any worse. Uh, it's just not really obviously recommended. Epiglottitis. So if you break this word down, the epiglottis is that little flap in the back of your throat that covers the trachea every time you swallow. It's attached by a ligament to your tongue. Itis, of course, the suffix means inflammation of. So inflammation of the epiglottis. Uh, seen predominantly in uh, little kids, uh, though that's changed over the years because now most children are uh, get shots to prevent this from happening. Uh, but what happens is, is usually this is caused by some type of bacterial infection and it swells up. The epiglottis swells up. And remember from our uh, anatomy class that on a small child, their tongue is larger, the epiglottis is larger, their mouth is smaller. So their airway is much smaller and this epiglottis swells up and it, it can actually completely occlude their airway. And, you know, 20 years ago, there was a 50% a mortality rate with epiglottitis. So half the kids that developed this died. Well, luckily now with these the immunizations they get and our aggressive treatment with this, it's, it's a lot better now. But once that epiglottis swells to the point where they occludes their trachea, we can't even do bag valve mass ventilations on them. Their airway is completely blocked and they, and they do die. So uh, take them to the hospital. Be very gentle with them. Don't jostle them around. Don't look inside their mouth. Um, let them sit any way they want, anywhere they want. They're like the 500-pound gorilla uh, because if you, if you make them walk or you jostle them around or you start sticking uh, your fingers in their mouth or something, you can actually stimulate the epiglottis to spasm and cut off their air. Take them to the closest emergency room, doesn't matter which one it is, and the doctor, if they need to, they can actually uh, trach the, the, the child and provide a, another airway uh, through their throat. Cystic fibrosis is a, a congenital condition. Uh, the poor little guys are born with this. It's a hypersecretion of mucus that just doesn't stop essentially and they go through these crisis uh, events where they hyper secrete even more than usual and they can't breathe their lungs are just, our lungs are just filled with mucus and they can't breathe they're usually on inhalers and different types of other uh, uh, medications like this they just they need high flow o2 uh, if necessary bag valve mass ventilations and rapid tra uh, rapid transport to the nearest hospital uh, that can, uh, can, can deal with this. 
Uh, some of these kids, when they get older, they get lungs. They actually, they, the, I think the only cure for this is a, is a, a lung transplant, uh, which is uh, it's pretty rare. So they, they usually die pretty young. By their time, they tend to hit about 20 there, or even before that, they usually have died from this condition. Now, little kids, pediatrics, specifically little kids under two years of age. Uh, as we spoke, spoke of before, kids are basically nose breathers. So they breathe through their nose, and the nose gets stuffed up, they have problems breathing. Anyone who has a cat or a dog who has gotten a cold, um, their noses get stuffy and they look like they're having trouble breathing. It's the same thing with a child of this age right here. So we will give them oxygen, obviously, um, but we can fix those blocked nasal passages. We have these bulb syringes you see in this picture right here, and we can, we can suck the mucus from their nose uh, their nostrils to get them breathing again. It helps a lot. So if you have a child who appears, you have a child who's less than two years of age and they have wheezes and they have obviously difficulty breathing and there's some kind of uh, history of some kind of infection going on and you notice that they're, both of their nostrils are just packed with mucus, if you can suck out that mucus, uh, it really takes care of most of their problem because they're just not happy breathing through their mouth. And all I have to say about this is signs of respiratory stress on, an, on a child, infant, or adult are about the same. The uh, extra use of accessory muscles, wheezes, retractions, rapid breathing, grunting, those types of things. The difference with kids uh, is they get, what, they, they get what's called seesaw respirations. Now, a child of this age, around two years old and younger, they're belly breathers. If you ever watch a little toddler or a little baby breathe, their belly rises and falls, not their chest, because they haven't really developed their chest muscles yet. They've more developed their, uh, their, uh, uh, their diaphragm muscle instead. So they're, they're diaphragmatically breathing. So when these kids have problems breathing, what you'll see is you'll see the chest and the belly rising opposite. So the chest will go out, then the belly will go out, the chest, belly, chest, and that's called seesaw respirations. So that's, that's the, the infant or young child's form of accessory muscle use, which is a really, really bad sign. Um, and they probably are would be in, in failure at that time. Also, little kids... Uh, they have very low levels of glucose and very low levels of storage of oxygen in their system, and they deplete those two sources very rapidly when they're sick or injured, and they do decompensate very quickly. So they go from a stable patient to an unstable patient within a few minutes if you don't you know, watch them carefully or treat them aggressively. And of course, if they go into respiratory failure and then even into arrest, uh, the big clue about a child, once they've gone into failure, their heart's going to start slowing down. They're going to become bradycardic. And remember, the, the definition of bradycardia is any heart rate less than, than 60 beats per minute. Um, a child of this age right here, their normal heart rate's about 100. So you encounter an infant who's cyanotic and their heart rate's 40, they need bag valve mass ventilations. And remember, when their heart gets that slow, it reduces their cardiac output, which causes hypotension, which causes a drop in their blood pressure. So it's kind of a, 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 a bad thing all around. By doing bag valve mass ventilations, reperfusing them with oxygen, you can get their heart rate coming up again and increase their blood pressure. 